this affects not just our daily lives, but also our health, the economy, wildlife, and most of all, how it places our future on hold. We have a panel of experts speaking today, focusing on the challenges of the pandemic and solutions for conservation in multiple areas and countries across, across the globe. I'll have the honor to present them in a few minutes, but first, to open the webinar, I'll pass the word on to the president of the Mirpuri Foundation, Paulo Mirpuri. Thank you, Anna. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on the, which part of the world you are. Uh, my name is Paulo Mirpuri and I'm the founder and president of the Mirpuri Foundation. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome all of you today to this uh, webinar. Wildlife conservation is one of the core areas of activity of the Mirpuri Foundation. And it is an honor uh, to be participating and sponsor such an important discussion. It is now well known that uh, human being is behind many species extinctions. Climate change and global warming induced by high levels of pollution and carbon emissions is causing extreme uh, weather events, sea level rise, warming and acidification of our oceans. Illegal hunting, poaching, and wildlife trade is today a multi-billion dollar business. Deforestation is threatening, threatening many species and ultimately our own long-term survival in this planet. But for the last 14 months, the world has been facing an unprecedented time with the largest pandemic in the last 100 years. Priorities have changed quickly at individual, family, and governmental levels. We have uh, seen ecosystems left alone and that were able to regenerate. But we have also seen the mass production of uh, protection equipment made of plastic that is ending up in the ocean aggravating what was already a very serious issue. It will be very interesting to understand the views of our panel of experts uh, today and how this COVID-19 pandemic is impacting the wildlife conservation. So I look forward to the discussions over the next uh, two hours and uh, I pass back to you, Anna, thank you. Thank you so much. We have now the perfect words to kickstart our webinar. But before we do, let me say that we'll have a Q&A session after the webinar. So please feel free to drop your questions to the speakers during the presentations. We'll go back to them afterwards. So it's time now to briefly present our incredible speakers here today and the outstanding work they are doing around the world. From Portugal to India now with us, Bishan Singh Bonal, a professional forester since the 80s, if I'm not wrong. He was part of the advisory board of Interpol, served in the government of India, amongst other roles. He is now associated with the Global Tiger Forum. Uh, so Bishan, can you please describe your line of work in a few minutes? Okay. <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, uh, thank uh, Jay and Anna and the Mir Mirpuri Foundation for inviting me for this uh, uh, webinar. I think uh, I'm, I'm not get, getting the slide. Uh, am I am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yes. Okay. You as, as as Anna, uh, you know, told that I'm basically a forester. Uh, you know, I, I had been in the government uh, service for thirty more than thirty seven years in different places, both in situ and ex situ uh, conservation, especially. To mention, uh, you know, Kajiranga National Park and uh, Manas National Park, which are the World Heritage Sites, and I had been as an additional director general of Forest Project Tiger, looking after the tiger reserves and uh, tiger management of the country. Uh, also, as a member secretary, Central Zoo Authority, who looks after the, you know, oversee the management of zoos in the country. Uh, you know, though we have one more than uh, 150 uh, zoos. Uh, apart and as 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 she mentioned that I'm associated with the uh, you know global tiger forum which is 
the only intergovernmental and international uh, organization uh, which, which covers the you know, Tiger Range countries, 13 range countries of the world. And uh, apart from that, uh, you know, I'm the alumni of Jersey Wildlife Trust, as Mr. J is. We were together in 2001, and I'm happy to see him. Uh, apart from the government uh, organization, you know, we have uh, uh, one civil society called Rang Kalyan Sansta, which is, uh, you know, uh, made by the uh, indigenous people uh, of the Himalayan, very remote area of the Kailas land landscape. I, I don't know whether you heard it or not. So uh, we belong to the uh, Kailas landscape, uh, especially three valleys, Dharma, Pyans, Chandas, and uh, uh, with the motto to conserve and protect the environment and the forest and upliftment of the people of that area, we, ha we have established that society. And by the way, I'm the president of that. and. Uh, uh, we are looking forward for for uh, such projects because we have been doing through the various projects sponsored by the government. And if uh, uh, some organization from abroad uh, comes, so Rankal and Sansta will be more than happy to, uh, you know, initiate and uh, act upon that. So with this, thank you very much uh, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm kindly ask you to stop to stop sharing your screen if possible. Oh, yeah, yeah. So whether the screen the screen was visible? Yes. You could see the screen? No, now it's now it's okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now to the UK, Robert Campbell leading United for Wildlife on behalf of the Royal Foundation with a background of project management and now focusing specifically on illegal <coughs> wildlife trade, correct? Welcome, Robert. Good morning. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, so I'll be um, fairly quick. I work for United Wildlife, which sits underneath the, the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Uh, the illegal wildlife trade is something the Duke of Cambridge uh, takes very seriously, and he sees it as one of his roles is uh, the conservation or uh, conservation is largely being seen as a, as a problem just for conservation sector alone. The Duke uh, in 2016 decided to bring in just 12 leading companies to discuss actions their industry could take to prevent criminals from using commercial infrastructure to move illegal wildlife products. And since then, that number has grown to 121 of the world's biggest air, maritime, and logistics organizations across the world. Following that, we've developed the Financial Task Force, which looks at uh, about the wholesale transformation in the detection, reporting, and investigation of IWT as a financial crime. And that now involves 44 of some of the biggest banks in the world. Um, through this network of partnerships, we provide intelligence, information, coordination uh, for the private sector so that they can play a role in disrupting criminal networks uh, involved in wildlife crime. And we've supported you know, some of the biggest law, uh, some of the most high profile law enforcement cases uh, that we've seen. And we believe uh, that greater collaboration uh, will support more effective information sharing uh, whereby public sector is prepared to an intention to receive and act on information that we can provide. Um, that's, that's a really quick run through, Anna. I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Rob. <coughs> now closer to home in Lisbon, José Dias Ferreira is the curator of mammals of Lisbon Zoo with over 20 years of experience and now coordinating as well the program for the Persian leopards. Bon dia. Bon dia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is José Dias Ferreira. Uh, I'm the curator of Lisbon Zoo for, for mammals. I've been doing and working with in the zoo world for the last 25 years. I'm also coordinating the, the breeding program for the Persian leopards for the European Association of Zoos and Aquarium. And uh, I'm also in close collaboration with uh, IUCN cat specialist group in the reintroduction of Persian leopards in the Russian Caucasus. I took part in the in the uh, Mirpuri uh, in the three Mirpuri Foundation expeditions uh, to the Caucasus Eco region in 2017 and 2018, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Mirpuri Foundation to, for inviting me to to talk about my work in this uh, webinar. Thank you. 
Thank you as well. Now, working closely with José Dias Ferreira is as well Rui Bernardino, a zoo veterinarian since 2004, mastering invasive surgeries and also the vet advisor for uh, of the Persian leopard. So good morning. Hello, good Rui. morning. It's a pleasure Welcome. to be here sharing uh, sharing our our the things that we learned in the last year. Um, besides my work as a, as a veterinarian at, at, at the Lisbon Zoo uh, and engaged in, in conservation efforts around the, the world, particularly in, with the Persian Albert, I was also uh, the, the, in charge of designing and the, implementing the contingency plan of the, of the COVID-19 at the, at, the, at the city zoo, or as, as, as we are in Lisbon Zoo. Um, we will have the opportunity to see the challenges as we work with so many different species uh, in the island in the center of a city. Um, so it, it would be a good opportunity to talk about the, the impact of COVID-19 in the, in the conservation, but from a different perspective, from the perspective of a city and not from the, the, the remote areas. So thank you again for the invitation. It is a pleasure here. It's a pleasure to be here again with, uh, with the Mercury Foundation. Thank you, Rui. Now, on the other side of the world, well, depending on where you're at in Australia, is Kelly Lee, uh, Executive Director of Science for Wildlife, a conservation biologist for more than 20 years now, and working currently in the Blue Mountains on koala conservation and research. A pleasure to have Kelly with us today. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Anna, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak um, tonight or today, your time. <laughs> um, so my background, uh, I actually spent about a decade in Africa working with large carnivores. Um, and so I'm familiar with the, the illegal wildlife trade and the threats over there. It's quite different here in Australia. Um, I've ended up working with koalas, of all things. Um, slightly easier to find than African wild dogs, but not by much. <laughs> Hopefully you can see my screen. So the organisation I work for is Science for Wildlife. We're a not-for-profit organisation, a medium-sized charity in Australia. And this is sort of the model of how we work. So we do science um, and scientific research to fill critical information gaps. We also very much about doing applied science and getting out to communities and landholders so that it's applied on the ground where it counts. So we also work to share knowledge with communities um, and also engage them by participation in workshops and actually in our research, about 80% of our data is collected by community members. Um, and also we work at a grassroots level in the community. So we're very focused on sense of place, um, which normally increases uptake with communities and also land managers using the research. And this evening, I'm going to be focusing on our flagship project, the Blue Mountains Koala Project, um, which is in the World Heritage Area in the Blue Mountains. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we're focusing on a whole bunch of basic research yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. Slide, I, I, save time. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Kelly. Um, I can we ask, I think that Bishan is, is uh, um, we're hearing some, some noise from, from your side, so you can mute yourself. I highly okay. appreciate it. You. Now, last but not the least, with a general overview joining from IUCN, Remco van Mern, with an incredible background in missions and research, is joining us today. So good morning and welcome, Remco. Good morning, Anna, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Remco van Mern. I'm the Species Conservation Grants Coordinator at IUCN's Saver Species Program. Um, now, established in 1948, IUCN is the oldest and the most diverse global environmental network. And there's a lot I could tell you about IUCN, but uh, outside the conservation sphere, I think it's probably best known through its Red List for Threatened Species. And so the Red List of Threatened Species is an assessment of the extinction risk of a species, uh, which is uh, science-based and uh, um, it's, uh, those assessments are undertaken by our wide, variety, our, our wide network of uh, more than 10,000 species conservation experts worldwide. Now in 2010, IUCN launched the Save Our Species program. And uh, it is a groundbreaking program for species conservation. And so based on the scientific assessments of the Red List, uh, we at IUCN Save Our Species, we select projects in the field that best address global conservation challenges for, uh, for the species. Uh, at a local level. And we do this uh, with a, a three-pronged approach on species, habitats, and people. 
So uh, we, uh, we, we fund projects that create conditions for species to thrive in healthy habitats while also providing benefits to the people that depend on them. So thank you very much and back to you, Anna. A pleasure to have you here with us today and to all of you actually. So we've been affected for and by the coronavirus for over a year now, a global health crisis that is impacting every single aspect of our lives in our planet. But how is it affecting wildlife conservation across the globe and in what way? Um, so to start, can you tell us, Bishan Bonal, please, how you've been assessing these challenges in India and specifically in your organization and line of work? The word is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anna. So let me let me first place the your uh, Anna. Okay. Okay. Am I audible now? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, as uh, I introduced that point of time, I could not show the slides. So, this is about my introduction. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, you know during the during the period we did the reintroduction of rhinos under Rhino Vision 2020 from Kajiranga to Manas, uh, which was affected by the uh, civil in insurgency, and also you know through the uh, you know Global Tiger Forum with the Tiger Range countries, uh, especially Bhutan, Nepal, and India. You know we did have the project called CATS Conservation Assured Tiger Standards and hat that is high altitude tiger conservation so uh, these are the very uh, you know in a prominent project which we had uh, in collaboration with the other tiger range countries so and uh, this is about my organization rang kalyan sanstha so uh, we are committed for the conservation of uh, uh, you know forest and wildlife in kailas landscape anyway so uh, I thought that I should introduce about a little bit about the forest and protected area network in India. So we have more than uh, 903 uh, protected areas, although the size of the protected areas, national parks and sanctuaries are uh, quite small, uh, unlike the African safaris and others. Uh, I, but uh, you know, significantly, I know you can understand that despite of having 15% of the you know, world population in India and uh, more than 15% of cattle population in India, uh, we have been having uh, this successful story of conservation of wildlife in India. A special uh, mention is about the tiger reserves, uh, which we started with nine number of uh, tiger reserves in 1973. Now we have 51 number of tiger reserves and it's, it's perhaps uh, one of the best projects uh, throughout the world so far as uh, conservation of wildlife and especially tiger is concerned. So far as uh, captive uh, you know, facility is concerned in India, uh, we have uh, 152 zoos of different categories, large, medium and small, and which is uh, regulated by the uh, organization called Central Zoo Authority. So, um, so far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, I, I, I think I don't have to explain how it originated, from where it originated. Uh, that uh, started from the Uyana in 2019 and spread uh, different countries and uh, it had impacted human beings in say, health uh, like anything I think it never before. Uh, and uh, which was confirmed that it just originated from the zoonosis, uh, you know, as a zoonosis disease uh, transmitted from the wildlife. Uh, so therefore, uh, if we you know, see apart from the human being affected, even in the captivity in the zoos, uh, the you know tigers were tested positive in in, in Bronx Zoo first. That was the first uh, you know uh, findings, and later on, uh, quite a good number of uh, the lions, tigers, snow leopards, and puma uh, gorilla were also tested. But uh, thankfully, uh, perhaps uh, in uh, most of the cases, they recovered from the uh, the COVID infection. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the India is a democratic country. We have uh, uh, you know, state governments and then uh, central government. So as I mentioned that all the zoos are uh, you know, regulated by the Central Zoo Authority, which is a regulatory authority, but basically it functions as a facilitator. During the COVID period, you know, uh, and on the basis of the experience of Bronx Zoo, the Central Zoo Authority issued an, a, a request to all the state government 
that uh, to consider all the zoo management as an essential service so that the supply of food and other uh, you know basic needs are uh, supplied with with no uh, interventions no problems and that is how the state governments did and uh, the the function was very smooth uh, apart from that the uh, upkeep and maintenance of animals and advisory on uh, you know covid 19 uh, were issued to all the zoos and most importantly that you know in case of any you know findings of positive uh, covid 19 or uh, other uh, problems uh, the referral uh, center was established uh, identified uh, uh, the indian veterinary research institute bareilly which is one of the uh, reputed institutions so uh, any case which, uh, when uh, diagnosed it was referred to them and uh, necessary advice were issued right by them uh, especially during this period you know no visitors were allowed uh, allowed in the zoos that means all the zoos were closed and uh, no visitors were allowed in the protected areas national parks sanctuaries and uh, tiger reserves uh, therefore uh, you know definitely it has affected the the, the revenue resources uh, and uh, thereby uh, affected uh, the the payment and uh, even the budget uh, of the institutions so far as manpower is concerned yes uh, you know the staffs they stayed despite of having all problems they stayed continuously in the protected areas that is how we find the positive result on that no poaching no encounters things like that but you know those uh, skilled laborers the temporary staffs who had to leave the site you know uh, it was difficult to replace uh, in their place uh, so despite of having the less manpower uh, the frontline staff staff did a tremendous job and uh, i think the big clapping for them i i, I suppose and uh, <clears throat> Now, if we see the the causative factors, you know how the zoonotic diseases uh, can get into is uh, because of the large scale conversion of forest. You know everybody knows now because of uh, conversion of forest land for the agriculture and other land use uh, purposes, maybe in the name of development. So a lot of areas has been you know uh, devastated. So therefore. Uh, and it le led to the you know, human wildlife conflict, uh, more interaction with the animals, uh, and, uh, and then intensified agriculture and livestock production. So it, it uh, brought the you know, wild animals uh, with close contact with the human being, and that is how the chances of uh, you know, conflict as well as chances of transmission of disease from the wild to human being and human being to wildlife uh, was increased. So uh, another thing is the climate change, which everybody knows uh, uh, was one of the uh, main factor for that. Uh, and illegal uh, and you know poorly regulated wildlife trade, you know, especially the the live animals and then uh, the body parts of the wildlife, especially in South Asian countries. Despite of a lot of efforts from the different sources, different organization in different levels, in the international level too. Uh, it has not been able to uh, to, to contain uh, or uh, control in the consumption sites, especially where the wildlife trade is, you know, ultimately uh, leads. Uh, that is one of the uh, problem, and these are the causative uh, factors. If we see during the uh, you know 2020 when the uh, the pandemic occurred. Uh, everybody was concerned about the health and all but if we see uh, the environment uh, point of view I, I i personally feel that positive impact has been more in terms of uh, uh, in terms of environment improvement and uh, forest and wildlife uh, their life uh, than than the negative one uh, if we just see the example wise the rhino poaching has been reported uh, especially in kenya uh, almost nil and the Kajiranga National Park, uh, Kajiranga Tiger Reserve, where I served more than nine years. Uh, and during my period, we had a very tough time. Every day we used to have an encounter with the poachers. And, uh, and uh, you know, in that encounter, most of the time, the poachers were uh, got killed, you know, and our staff also were at the risk of, of their life. And uh, in an average, I think uh, over the period, about uh, 10 to 24 number of, uh, you know, rhinos used to be poached. Uh, you know, against that, if you see that uh, during pandemic time to, from 2019 and 2020, I think only three cases and two cases of rhino poaching there in the in the Kajiranga National Park, and uh, uh, no poaching has been reported for the tigers and elephant. And in, in, in fact, even uh, there was no encounter with the poachers. That means, uh, you know, the the people uh, who used to venture out for for poaching and all, so they were also concerned about their health. So they remained quite in their home and they didn't come for the 
coaching. So that is how you know it it has a had a you know positive effect on that. But the staff, uh, I mean, uh, frontline staff who had to remain there even in the odd times and odd period, despite of having so all problems with the family and all, so they continued to be there in the field and they did the you know their very best. And I must say uh, that they have done the best job. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there there should be a big clapping for those uh, frontline staff. Now. Uh, although uh, no tourism was there, so it had a negative impact on the economic. But uh, it, because of that, there was a least pressure on the wildlife in both the protected areas and zoos, and thereby they had a good time. Their health improved, and uh, you see, uh, it was an opportunity for the you know nature to revive themselves through the, you know naturally, and then. Uh, reduced uh, you know pollution i think in india especially in delhi where where i belong to where i stay we we could seldom see the clean uh, air and clean uh, you know sky but during that period uh, one could see the snow cladded mountain of the himalayas right from the chandigarh and all and uh, then water pollution was quite uh, free in fact the yamuna and ganga which, which uh, had a number of projects by the government uh, government uh, uh, during those period, it was uh, it didn't affect much, but because of the COVID-19, uh, the pollution level had reduced like anything, and then water was very very clean, you know. So that way, you know, you know the whole environment, air pollution, noise pollution, and water pollution were quite uh, you know improved one. Uh, then stress-free captive animals, then carbon emission was definitely reduced, and then uh, the the uh, lighter part, I I, I should mention that. Uh, the people has become now, you know, computer shavy, you know, after the having the system of work from home. Otherwise, we used to work in the office. Now, this system has been introduced and most of the time now uh, work from home and through the uh, online and computer. Even the seminars and, web, you know, and the workshops are being conducted through the webinars and all. So I think these are the uh, quite uh, positive things. And then. Uh, most importantly, again, the people are aware about the zoonosis uh, uh, and genetic disease, you know, you know and what they should uh, do and what they should not do uh, um, with the with the forest and wildlife. So, therefore, the people are, have become a little more aware in, in comparison to earlier period. But, but yeah, there had been a negative impact of of COVID. It had affected the global and local uh, economy. Uh, so India is not an exception. The health and food was affected very badly, and uh, as I mentioned, staff and uh, the budget, even the the budget of the government uh, to the pro uh, protected areas and tiger reserves has been reduced uh, because the most uh, expenditure had gone towards the COVID and so now if we see that what we learned from uh, uh, from those effects, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, reduce the risk of zoonotic disease. Uh, by reducing the destroying of the forest and all, and uh, unsustainable extraction of wildlife and in you know the plants and herbs which used to be there, I think then everybody understands that I think we we need to control and that so that zoonotic diseases are not spread. Now, if we talk about the way forward, uh, I think uh, you know Michelle, you see I'm the. Sorry, I'm sorry to to interrupt. Um, we're a little over the time. We can you can you please uh, mention solutions in the next question? And okay. Can... Yeah. This is last slide. So way forward, uh, I I should mention that the government departments and and the NGOs and uh, you know like-minded people should think of reducing the human wildlife conflict so that zoonosis is not there. And then uh, the the development, of course, uh, nobody is against the development, but it has to be rational without impacting the environment and forest and wildlife. And uh, you know coexistence and uh, co-occurrence uh, principle should be uh, you know followed. So this, thank you very much. If I taken more time. Sorry for that. And thank you. Thank you once again. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ronel. Well, the ongoing crisis, uh, COVID crisis, has brought, uh, I believe, renewed attention to the global problem of wildlife trafficking. So Robert Campbell from the United for Wildlife perspective, did the pandemic affect positively this issue or instead uh, even escalated the problem from your perspective? Thanks, Anna. Just load up my slides. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I, I will speak um, mainly from a global point of view. Some of the poaching and trafficking incidents, I'll specifically look at Africa. Um, as I said at the beginning, United for Wildlife 
really is a um, is a collaboration of some of our uh, sort of partner organizations. And so these statistics come from our intelligence partners and both intelligence team. We send them out to airlines, shipping companies and banks. Um, the reason I've got this slide, so this is from EIA, the Environment Intelligence uh, sorry, Investigation Agency, is because I think it's important to show, it looks like there's been dramatic success. It looks like seizures are down. Granted, this is just from January to June last year, but it looks like, you know, it's half of 2019, you know, things are going well. But I think the story, the full story here isn't quite uh, laid out. And if you, um, if you look at the seizure data, you know, you and compare it with previous years, it does look great. However, um, a lot of seizures, as we know, uh, or seizures aren't the full picture. Seizures are the bits that get caught, whereas we know there are tens or hundreds of incidents that go through. Um, and it's likely that, you know, there could be a number of reasons for the seizures being down. You know, maybe that's a reduction of passenger flights during lockdown, uh, perhaps a decrease in law enforcement capability and resources. I mean, on the passenger flight stuff, we saw just in March 2020, the international passenger flights have dropped by 95%. So, you know, anything that's moving in baggage and, and sort of cargo is going to be subject to a far more scrutiny or cut off completely. Um, you know, decreased reporting also it could be a factor due to the agents, uh, agency or media reporting, looking at coronavirus stories. You know, maybe there's uh, related illegal cross-border activities such as smuggling and uh, people and protective equipment. You know, this is, this is also down to, you know, far fewer staff being available at borders to undertake these comprehensive searches. So there's a number of reasons why seizures could be down. So now we'll go into a sort of bit of the, the data that we have found from our partners on the ground. So this is from East Africa and Southern Africa. And in general, through lockdown, you know, we saw uh, poaching roughly continued. Uh, little to no serious trafficking. So the movement of goods didn't, you know, really slow down. And that again would have uh, contributed to that low seizure data. Um, it, likely because the inability of, you know, some of the Asian buyers coming over to Africa to conduct you know, business face-to-face -face meetings, which used to be uh, the way to go. Um, you know, so, you know, this meant that items were being consolidated by criminals, you know, this sort of stockpiling ready for when the trade borders open up again. The risk here is that new avenues to reach the marketplace are being, uh, you know, set up. You know, prior to lockdown, as I say, unusual for, uh, you know, buyers not to come to Africa to sort of source deals and, and, and set sort of parameters. But with these, traffic, tra uh, with these travel restrictions, you know, that means that, you know, this is shifting to online buying now. And there's more of a trust. I mean, like we're doing here, there's a lot more virtual meetings. Um, but it, it looks like there's sort of online marketplaces opening up, which, which has, you know, uh, risks in that, you know, far easier for, for buyers to, to get materials or, or items, but also presents a potential benefit to or, so task force members like banks who sit under our task force, because they have a much better, um, if everything is online, uh, more access to, to see the transaction data, to see the trends and things like that. And I think that's important. Now, what we've seen post lockdown, so poaching rose dramatically. Um, some of the, as some of the restrictions were lifted, some traffickers uh, had already started to dispatch illegal wildlife trade shipments, but via sea routes, you know, demonstrating the continued demand for ivory and pangolin scales. Further increases in corruption, definitely interference at police stations on the vicinity of national parks. Um, also down to some of the jobs insecurity of rangers and law enforcement within the parks. Um, you know, uh, lack of job security presents opportunities for bri bribery. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen continuation of low sentences handed out by courts. Um, you know, overall lessons learned in, in this respect is generally that, that trafficking has reduced and, and poaching has increased. And the presence of tourists on, the on these parks, you know, can't be understated. That extra set of eyes you know, on the ground as a level of as, as a layer of security on top of law enforcement and ranger efforts. I want to say that, you know, that this is a task force results thing. I'm just coming to the end now. But one of the things I, I think is important, if you look at the arrests, so within our task force, you know, we've, we've got 200 or so airlines, shipping companies and banks. Um, and over the last few years, you know, this number of arrests, this is where airlines or shipping companies or banks have assisted with counter poaching efforts on investigations into you know, high profile trafficking uh, cases. 
Now, in the last six months of 2020, we saw 14 arrests. And in the first two months of this year, we've seen 11. So this number is really is jumping up quite highly. And I think what's important to see is that law enforcement uh, and regulatory efforts are increasingly looking to the private sector to assist with investigations. So every criminal transaction you know, should have an audit trail that the banks can, can map. And every seizure you know, should be paid for by an account number that the bank can trace up the chain and, and slowly start to map a wider criminal organization rather than just the, uh, the mule or the person associated directly. And I just think that's really important to look is that, is that there's some real light at the end of the tunnel, but the private sector coming into this, I think is one of the solutions I'll talk more about in a bit, but, um, but I'll hand over to the next speaker, but thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll pass on the word to uh, José Díaz Ferreira from Zoo Perspective. Uh, for you, what was the major challenge caused by the pandemic? Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Let me share the screen yes. first. My internet connection is not completely stable. I don't know if you can hear me well or not. Is the sound okay? It's perfect. Okay, good. So um, uh, to talk about this first, I would like to, I have to talk a little bit about the, 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 the program because, and I'm sorry about the three lines title. It's a complex subject. I need to, I need to, to do it like this. So I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the Persian leopard ex to one and to conservation program. So I'm going about the beginning of the collaboration between EAS, IUCN and WWF, the EP adjustment. So we had to do uh, to the reintroduction project, uh, the Caucasian leopard introduction group and the Sochi breeding center and then the COVID-19 challenge. So part of my presentation is about the, the, the breeding program so you understand the connection between uh, what we are doing in zoos and what we are doing in the world. So the connection. So everything started in 2005 when the reintroduction uh, program uh, was developed by the Russian Academy of Sciences and WWF Russia. Uh, and in 2006 approved by the Ministry of the Natural Resources of Russia. And in 2008, a breeding center was built in uh, Sochi, near the Sochi uh, National uh, Park. And this center was built to receive animals, to breed, for them uh, to, 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 to be trained in the center. So we can see uh, uh, several uh, enclosures. Some of them are for breeding, some others are for, uh, for training animals for release. So there were several inspections. This is how the center looks inside. You have some, some the, the entrance and then the perimeter fence, the area where you can, when you can monitor all the enclosures because the leopards here are uh, bred without any uh, human contact. So the doors, everything needs to be done from a distance. A MOU was signed between the Ministry of Natural Resources of Russia, IUCN and the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And of course, this MOU included transfers from the, the zoo population from the EP to the Sochi breeding center. We had to adjust the, the breeding program and uh, to be able to cope with the, the reintroduction uh, project. And we transferred in 2012, the first uh, transfer of a, of a breeding pair. This was a proven breeding pair. At the time, it was the best uh, breeding pair in Europe, and we sent it to Sochi uh, to uh, to have them uh, uh, ready in the breeding enclosures. And what happened was they were keeping another breeding pair, and this arrival stimulated breeding at at the center. So six months later, uh, the first cubs were born from Andrea, our female from Lisbon Zoo, Portugal, and then uh, after that, the second breeding pair also started to to, to breed. So uh, the, the idea would be to, uh, to increase the population in order to have animals ready for release. So we add several new institutions uh, to the program uh, between 2013 and 2020. 20 new breeding pairs were established 
and we start breeding with the existing pairs. So before the COVID-19, we had 29 pairs with breeding recommendation. So the numbers 85 in 2012 and in 2020, 114 in 43 zoos. This is how the population looks in, the, in our zoos in Europe. Each, uh, each dot, orange dot represents a, a zoo with a breeding pair or without a breeding pair. It depends, of course. We also want one of the main points of this program is to improve genetic composition of the EP. Once again, this means a lot of transfer between zoos and uh, uh, to, to be able to have a, a, a genetic uh, viable population in zoos. So we searched for new olders. We gained uh, two new olders by adding Tierra and Zoo to the population. New founders were transferred from such a breeding center to Nell Zoo. And we also start doing uh, artificial insemination. Just to, to have a, a short uh, information about the complexity of this program. We need to analyze every breeding pair before recommending breeding. This is one of the programs called PMX that we use to, uh, to, to study which breeding pairs need to breed at which moment. Okay, in 2014, the first uh, artificial insemination done by uh, uh, Dr. Imk Luder. This is a photo of the first female born from artificial insemination, which is in Lisbon Zoo. We took this opportunity also to talk about Persian leopards when Joel Sartori from National Geographic visited the zoo. And uh, the transfer, we did several transfers, around uh, 35 transfers during the last 10 years. But this was a very important one because it was a transfer from uh, uh, Lisbon Zoo to Tehran. So the animals came from the, to the zoo population 10 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, sorry. And now we are sending them this breeding pair, this breeding animal to uh, Tiaran Zoo to breed with the female they were keeping back then, uh, which is Kija. You can see that she has an amputated uh, forelimb, but she's a, an animal that was not represented in the DEP population. Of course, this again, the COVID-19 also uh, uh, stopped the transfer of animals between zoos. This is one of the main investments that we do to keep the population genetically viable. Okay, the first insemination uh, in um, uh, Tehran. Uh, we can see Rui Bernardino, uh, my colleague, is a veterinarian, and Imke Luders. And also in 2019, we traveled to, to Sochi to uh, collect semen from General, which is an animal, is, is already 17 years old, but is uh, an animal that is very important for the population. Uh, the semen is frozen. We also did some survey in order to improve the enclosures at zoos to make it uh, as good as possible. We formed a group uh, called Caucasian Leopard Introduction Advisory Group to have one voice uh, to talk about conservation and reintroduction. We have people from the IUCN Cat Specialist Group from Cologne Zoo in Germany, myself, and WWF Russia. So all together working in order to have one voice while advising uh, the, the, our colleagues in Russia. So in Sochi Breeding Center, you can see a short uh, pedigree. I cannot uh, spend much time here, but I will explain it. Uh, it's uh, the, two, the two animals that came from Lisbon Zoo, Zadig and Andrea, and the other uh, breeding pair, Alaus and Cherry, and all the descendants. Some of these descendants, a total of 10, were introduced in the Caucasus Biosphere Reserve in Russia and in Alanya National Park uh, in North Ossetia in 2016, 18, and 20. This is how it looks like, the confirmed areas of, uh, uh, of the Persian leopards in the, the Caucasus ecoregion, the possible presence, and you can see the big area, which is the historical uh, uh, rich distribution of this species. This is just some photos of the introduction of 2016. This female was uh, the daughter of our female in Lisbon. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it was the first female to be reintroduced into Caucasus. Regarding the COVID-19 challenge, before Anna says for me to rush <laughs> and, to, and to do, so we, we, we have, of course, uh, some impact. And the main one was no transfer between zoos. So cubs born in 2017 had to stay longer with their mother and with the second litter, if a second litter was born. 
new breeding pairs, uh, we had to keep them on hold because uh, we don't know how much time this is going to, 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 to continue. And the delay of another breeding pair that is supposed to be transferred to uh, the Sochi breeding center from Northern Zark. This, already, this has already been done, but it took one year more than usual. So we have a lot of animals uh, in enclosures in zoos in Europe, ready to be transferred between them. But uh, the transports are much more complicated, more uh, expensive and delayed. So recent uh, established pairs that need to stop uh, breeding. So the animals need to be separated through a fence or, or they need to be physically se separated or with a contraception because we don't know when the litters we need or can be uh, uh, transferred. And now regarding the Sochi breeding center uh, impact of COVID, this is Natalia Dranova from WWF Russia. She's our contact in, this, in Sochi breeding center. And the same thing is happening. So the transport of the proven breeding pair with restriction, which means that they, they have a, an enclosure in Sochi breeding center and uh, that is empty, ready to receive this new uh, breeding pair. Uh, so the, 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 the animals that were born in, in the Sochi breeding center uh, are being kept at the Sochi breeding center, op occupying space, which is important uh, uh, for new leopards. And the late release of 2020. So we have to wait for the experts to evaluate these animals before they were released, which meant that the, 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 we did, to, we did the, the reintroduction three months later, which is very, very problematic when you have a, a short or a small window of opportunity to de do these uh, reintroductions. Regarding, and I don't, do I have time still or not? Two more minutes. Okay, so news from the field regarding the Cau Caucasus uh, ecoregion from Dr. Aurel Eidelberg. So including all the projects, not only the introduction we are doing in, in the uh, Russian Caucasus, but also uh, what uh, the, all the other pro projects that are uh, in course uh, in, um, uh, sorry about this. So, so the first COVID uh, wave didn't, did not eat the uh, Caucasus substantially, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. The second COVID uh, wave reached very high incidence until December, 2020. And the governments such as Armenia, Azerbaijan responded with travel restrictions and lockdown. Of course, this, uh, one of the main uh, problems of this was the fact that they didn't, they couldn't have residential uh, uh, visits or meetings, which made everything much more complicated. Uh, the fact that uh, um, the travel restrictions have a substantial impact on the overall uh, project goals. And uh, of course that we have a, a positive, or well, Aurel has a positive uh, perspective on this. And he, he thinks that this will all go back to normal uh, within this year. And talking a little bit about the positive impact uh, that uh, still that can, could could have uh, come from this uh, uh, pandemic, it's the less people that enter into nature, uh, leaving negative impact on nature and wildlife in particular. But this, of course, is only a, a, a hypothesis and needs to be analyzed. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zay. Thank you very much. Moving forward, as um, as a vet specialized in protecting wildlife and specifically reintroducing animals into the natural habitat, what is your opinion, Rui Bernardino, on the impact of COVID-19 on wildlife conservation? Okay, let me share my screen. Jose, I, I think, okay, thank you. I let think me you share, have to stop. Stop yeah. sharing, okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, I did it already. Okay, thank you. So, do you have the image, I, I guess? It's correct? Yes. yes okay. 
So uh, I'm trying to give a different perspective uh, because conservation is engaged since uh, from the in situ from in situ um, perspective, and the impact of of uh, COVID nineteen is uh, particularly important in uh, in places where uh, there's an absolute need of the a continuous work because if we consider that uh, health care is a specialized work the the work that is performed by keepers it's very specialized so and we deal with so many different species we don't know the impact of the disease in, the, in this uh, so much different species so we can have an idea of the complexity of uh, establishing um, um, a way to control uh, an outbreak in a in a in a city zoo so I will go forward and try to resume the main action, the main actions that we did in the last in the last year. One of the things that I always like to address when when we speak to our to our uh, students uh, regarding science is that we have to consider the measures that we take at the specific moment in uh, of knowledge. Um, and the, the, one of the, the bigger challenges regarding the COVID-19 is that we had to start taking measures before we got so many answers that we need. We had many questions, but the answers, um, even one year um, since the beginning, the, 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 the questions are, 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 still, um, uh, are still not enough. So we can imagine that in the beginning of March, when we start with the with the contingency plan, uh, the the number of information was was really low, but measures have to be taken since the beginning, and we have to to remember that in the beginning of the pandemic, even the the information that we got from outside was was not uniform. If we remember, for example, from even from the national authority um, of else national authority, it was uh, we got. Um, Conflict, a conflict information regarding, for example, the use of masks, the need of the social distancing. So it's 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 in the beginning it's a little bit confusing. So uh, because the information it's it's not so uniform as we need to take to take uh, to take actions from from the beginning. Um, and then we have to to consider that uh, we have a policy of hands on on animals. Uh, these animals, when they are under human care, we need to give them the best options as, as we can in terms of science, in terms of medicine, is a completely different way to face the diseases as we have in the, in the, in the, in the wild. Um, and so in our daily work, we, we, our daily work is done um, on, a, on a direct contact with different kind of people uh, from the perspective, from the, from from keepers to different kind of specialists, etc., and so during these times we have to reformulate all of these, all of these way of work because if we take uh, a bad option one day, it can it can it can bring us to a, to an outbreak, and then we don't have people to work in the next in the next day. So um, all of our kind of our way of of, of work during, during the pandemic was completely changed, and is still is still being completely changed till today. It's not only the, the work that we do in terms of science, but also the work that the keepers do. The, 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 the job of the keeper is a very specific uh, kind of work. It's not easy to replace that work from one day to the, to, to the other. So um, we have to guarantee that these people work with um, in terms of uh, of uh, security, in terms of uh, health problems regarding COVID, and the, the other question is the proximity that we have from people and, and to animals and the probability of of infection. I will talk a little bit about that also. So we should not forget that we have an island in the, in the, in the center of the city. People live at home with 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 children that go to school, travel. Uh, in inside of the inside of the inside of the city, we need to have a maintenance uh, team that do the the daily work. We need to exceed the same kind of things that we we need at home: food, specific pellets, etc. So uh, 
uh, in the wild, animals don't need people to to drink and to and to eat. But in the in a captivity in a captivity situation like this, is completely different. So, uh, if I will say that the main challenge is from one side to protect people because we are talking about specialized work. In the other side, we have to protect animals from different kind of, of perspectives, and this work have to be done every day. It cannot stop. And on top of that, we have to put also public, because most of, of zoos they are depending on, on, the, on the entrance of people to these spaces. Uh, and uh, across the world, we are not in position to close the entries. Uh, so we have to deal also with that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex model that we need to, to address in terms of uh, guarantee of, uh, of, of health for people and for 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 animals also so obviously the 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 it's a little bit complex the process but if i need to outline the 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 measures that i think are, were the most important till now i would say the shifts no 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 doubts about that the 14 day shifts are really important to to have teams that do not uh, are maintained together that will stay 14 days at home uh, that's the way we have not to have cases in the second shift. Uh, so if for any chance we get a, a, an outbreak, we are sure that once we have people at home 14 days, this, this, um, the, this, this outbreak will, will finish. This is particularly important when we are dealing with a, with a, with a, with a disease with so many cases of uh, symptomatic uh, cases. Uh, then, which is utmost important, is the risk assessment of signs and contacts. So we, 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 we do that. We don't rely only on the national authority because sometimes the, the, the answers are, are too late. The questionnaires some of the times are not performed. So what we do is to have a direct contact with, with people through questionnaires before coming to the shift, uh, uh, permanent uh, communication. So we can, since the beginning, uh, take out people and not to put the others on risk. So we have a, 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 a personal risk assessment of signs and contact in context. Um, and then at the end, what one of the most important thing is, is communication. Communication is it's, it's, uh, um, it's one of the most important things because we rely on the attitude of people. We can control the attitude of people inside of our organizations but we cannot control their attitude outside and one of the things that it's 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 it, that we learn from this experience is that uh, fake news is something that is 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 very hazard to 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 the COVID, to the response of the of, of people to covid-19 so it's there's estimation of around 3000 uh, fake news per day that are produced uh, about covid-19 and we depend on every people to take measures and to take this seriously. So the way we have to combat this is to communicate, direct communicate with people, with keepers, particularly the, the persons that, work, that have this specialized work. So we have almost separate people that work with animals than that work in other areas and to pay special attention to this kind of, 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 of work. So this is a, an example of a sheet that we have to do the questionnaire uh, before coming to the new shift. Uh, we have a different kind of informations that from the different people in the place where they live, the kind of transports that they need to use. Uh, we have uh, we have used different shadows to use in common areas uh, from different different teams in order if we have an outbreak, not to have a, a massive, a massive outbreak. So we had to pay specific attention to locker rooms, to repertory. We 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 draw we addressed many different um, rules to to the use of these spaces, um, and then to create a, a clear separation of uh, people that work with animals and people that work not in animal area and that can perform the work uh, from from their homes. So we have a, 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 a very strict rules for all the, the, the organization. In terms of animals, obviously, it's uh, somehow facilitated because we work with bi biosecurity guidelines uh, since ever. So it's, 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 easier, it's easier to, 
to address more more needs if we if we have them but people wear masks they use the uh, different kind of disinfectants etc so one of the things that we had to do is to reduce contact with, from with people and animals um, but also to maintain the chain of supply we should not forget that some of the some of the um, pellets for example are very specific for these animals and are we are depending from overseas um, supply so we have to consider these months before in order not to have a, a, a breakdown in that in that supply and one of the most important questions since the beginning is the which impact can, impact can ha, can COVID-19 have on 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 animals um, it's interesting because it started two months after the the the, the outbreak uh, of COVID-19 in, in in the world um, we, we we start searching for answers regarding this issue so and it's it's it, it's interesting because we can do projections um, using database models we can do projections from different suspect susceptibilities of animal species to covid to SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV why because we know that uh, uh, the the covid the SARS-CoV-2 at specific binding places to the ACE2 receptor on cells. So as we have a database of these uh, ACE2 uh, um, receptors on different kind of animals, we can do a, a projection of which animals are more prone to be affected by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but when I say affected, it's very important because one thing is to get infected. The other thing is to get infected and a, a, a high degree of disease or a lower degree of disease or if they can transmit the disease or not so these models can tell us the probability of infection uh, and more or less if the impact it's 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 a, it's a, a bad scenario or a, a low grade of uh, of a disease uh, but it's a, it's a, it's only a projection it's 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 not a, defini a definitive uh, answer so the, the, the way to do it is to look the particular amino acids from the receptors that we know that in humans are, uh, are mandatory for the entrance of the virus inside of the cells. And we can look for, from, for different species and to see how this uh, binding probability is, is present. Uh, interesting, interest, it's interesting that some of the species we were prepared to to, we could understand that, and others is, is, is uh, other kind of surprise. For example, uh, primates from Africa and, and Asia are have the same have the same structure in terms of the binding place of the virus. So we know that they are very prone to get the disease. Till now, we don't we don't get we don't know um, if the disease is is mild, if the disease is severe. We have we have one answer that it's interesting that I will tell you in a moment. Um, but then the primates from South, for example, the primates from South America, they are much less prone to get the uh, virus inside of the of the. I'm sorry, of the... we are exceeding time. Sorry to okay. push. No problem. Just to 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 say that uh, so we ha we can predict more or less the 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 problems that we'll have in the future with some of the species. Uh, this is really important because we need to uh keep on uh, maintaining measures in some of the species and maybe project uh, vaccines for for some of the species in the um, in the future so for us it's it's uh, a really important uh, information thank you thank you so much Rui. let's um go to australia now it's probably one of the countries in the world least affected by the pandemic, I would say, um, but you have always uh, or as well been affected by this lack of balance between nature and humans uh, and the consequence uh, this brings. So uh, Kelly, can you please share with us your take on environmental impact in the last year? Absolutely, thank you, Anna. Um, so my internet has been a bit unstable too, which is why I had my video off, but hopefully it will hold good for this. 
Um, so yeah, we have done very well with COVID-19 here as an island country. Um, so the impact on our wildlife has been multifaceted, not just COVID-19. Um, so just to draw the links between um, what I'll be talking about today, um, you know, we come down to the world population as currently sitting at about 7.8 billion people. Um, and related to that number of people, obviously it's more people than have ever been on the planet before. Um, together with that, we have habitat encroachment and that has two impacts. So when you're taking away wildlife habitats, you're pushing them out of preferred habitats and then they can, they're more predisposed to develop disease. Um, and then, of course, as people encroach on habitats, you also have them coming into contact through vectors, um, can, which can be various species, um, and contracting those diseases. And then, of course, when you've got relatively high population densities, that's where you see very fast spread of disease as well. Um, on the other side of things, also related to that high world population, is the increasing carbon dioxide and global warming impacts. Um, and that is actually what we've seen more here in Australia first, at least. Um, so I'm going to go through more of the climate change impacts as a, as a related factor, and then I'll touch on COVID-19 as well. Uh, so last summer, fortunately, this summer has been a lot better. Uh, we called it the apocalyptic summer here in Australia on the East Coast. Um, the four horsemen that rode through were drought, fire, flood, and then pestilence in the form of COVID-19. Um, so I'll be taking you through that, that story. <laughs> um, so as a case study, I'm going to be talking out of, about our Blue Mountains koala project, and that focuses on koalas as an iconic flagship species. So if you're protecting koalas, and they are a threatened species in Australia, you have to protect their habitats, which is native eucalypt forests in Australia. So by protecting those forests, you then protect a whole range of other species at the same time. So they're really, you know, if you can serve the koala, you can help a lot of other species at the same time. The site where we're working, and it's one of the reasons it's listed as a World Heritage Area, is because of outstanding diversity of eucalypts. So koalas have more food tree choice in this area than anywhere else in the country. And we can, before the fires here, we had a real story of hope. So although koalas are declining across the species range um, in most areas, we actually were finding growing populations of koalas in sandstone country where people didn't really think that they existed or if they did that, they've been really low density and not important. We did a collaborative genomic study um, with the Sydney University, San Diego Zoo and James Cook University. And out of 22 populations right across the east coast of Australia, so from South Australia up to far north Queensland, the highest levels of genetic diversity in koalas are in this Blue Mountains World Heritage Area. We had a population that's also chlamydia free, which is quite an unusual thing. That's, that's a big impact on koalas in many areas. And they're also living outside of the modelled climate envelope which is supposed to be up to 800 metres, we've got them living at 1,100 metres. In fact, we had some sitting in snow just months before the fires here. In terms of how we work, and this links back to the impacts of, of COVID-19, we're very much um, involved in engaging the community in our work. So we do that at different levels. Um, so from raising general awareness in communities, particularly in and around the World Heritage Area, um, we want them to know there's koalas around and, and what threats they face and also get them to report sightings to us because if we're trying to find koalas in a million hectares we need to know where to start and it's really helpful to have a koala report a sightings report and go right we can look at that sort of habitat in a more remote area we run talks and workshops so teaching people about how do you how to identify eucalypts and different habitats um, how to look for koalas in different habitats as well. And then they're very engaged in all of our field work as well. Um, so they come out on surveys. We do scat surveys looking for koalas, camera traps um, and radio tracking. So down the bottom of the screen there, you can see some of the numbers from last year. Um, we've got over 400 registered volunteers involved in our work. During and after the bushfires, we had 150 people helping out across our sites. Um, we had 80 people helping with systematic surveys and another 45 people deeply engaged in, in radio tracking koalas um, after the fires and after care as well. So, yeah, it's, it's a huge part of our capacity is having people involved. Um, so we had that story of hope with koalas um, and then came climate change. Um, so we had a lot of a long drought and record breaking heat conditions driving these fires. Um, I think most people probably 
saw the news. Um, essentially, a large part of the east coast of Australia went up in smoke. I had to personally evacuate my home as well. The fire got within about 800 metres here. Um, and we had weather systems with these fires moving right across the World Heritage Area. There was about three in different, three different directions from my place. Um, so the impacts of the bushfires here were, were catastrophic. So out of that 1 million hectares, which is made up of eight protected areas in national parks, so that's, I think that's about 2.5 million acres, 80% of that was impacted by fire. Um, and we've never seen all of those protected areas burn at once before. Um, in terms of the study sites where we were working, we had five study sites identified where we'd found evidence of koalas and we'd surveyed the first two. Um, and all of them but one were impacted by fire with up to 100% coverage of koala habitats that we'd mapped. So you can see here, this is just one of our study sites. We'd mapped koalas down in the developed areas where there's communities um, and then right up north through here. And this is the size of the fire that came through um, just one of the fires as well. So out of that, we then launched into quite a lot of emergency response work. We actually carried out the first emergency evacuation of koalas in front of an approaching fire front, um, simply because of the scale of the fires, there was risk of losing all of the koala populations. So we managed to get in in front of a fire with um, permission from national parks and pulled some out, took them to a zoo for safekeeping. Uh, we then did, after the fires had stopped, we did water stations and food drops because dehydration and starvation were the biggest threats um, facing wildlife then with all the habitats gone. Um, so we did over 240 stations across three sites and maintained them on a weekly basis with our army of volunteers. And then also search and rescue work, um, including with our scat dog smudge. So getting out looking for koala scats to try and find surviving animals. And that's when COVID-19 started, started coming in. So we had, we'd rushed these to get these koalas out in front of the fire. We had to keep them in place at the zoo for about three months because we were waiting. We did have really heavy rains, um, flash flooding that then washed all of the ash beds into the waterways. So it removed all that, all those nutrients for regrowth and contaminated the waterways, um, which is one of the reasons we were, we were putting out clean water as well. Um, and then COVID-19 came along and we had to race to get the koalas back. They were two and a half hours drive from where we took them from, from the zoo. Um, so we pushed that out fairly quickly. And then in, in terms of, you know, the amplification effect on that, some of the biggest impacts here were, so for example, with, with the koala habitats across the East Coast, about 30% of habitats were burnt. Um, and that's the known habitats of an already threatened species. So it was a huge impact just on koalas. A lot of other species with smaller home ranges and smaller populations were more heavily impacted than koalas were. Um, in terms of COVID, we didn't really go into a strict lockdown here, um, but it did have a big impact. Um, you know, the restrictions were in place, travel was restricted, um, and it certainly impacted people in terms of working from home um, and some job losses as well. But one of the biggest things from the wildlife side of things was it took attention away from the bushfire impacts as well. So this was one of an opportunity, you know, for the first time climate change was a regular discussion point in Australia because we had never seen fires of this intensity and scale before. So it was on the political agenda. Um, and then COVID-19 came in and, you know, it was largely forgotten. So, and that did impire impaired post-fire efforts as well. Um, so some examples in terms of how it hit us specifically. So we had to shut down our volunteer army of people that were out helping with the post um, bushfire work. Uh, we had put out camera traps on all of our water and food stations to try and assess what was being used and where we had surviving wildlife. Um, and those had to be left out for some months. And then one of the core activities we were doing was radio tracking koalas that we'd rescued and put back in the fire zone because we want to see how they use the burnt landscape and that would help tell us where else we could look for surviving koalas. Um, so we had to employ more staff. We had to shut down our volunteers from that um, and just employ essential staff to do that work, which was daily tracking to start with in quite a remote area. And then also because of the bushfire impacts, we couldn't just send people in for field work. One of the things that prevented people across the country from getting into the fire zones and helping wildlife after the fires was lack of access. There just wasn't enough resources going in to make safe areas. So they send teams in um, 
to basically do hazardous tree assessments and determine if people can go in or not. So we ended up hiring our own team of arborists um, to go in in front of our field teams onto the black um, and to assess them and, and put through safe routes. So in terms of ongoing, some of the things we're doing, you know, we, we work outdoors. All of our work is, is in fairly remote areas, so it is lower exposure risk compared to in the cities. Um, we have put volunteer protocols in place. We've got volunteers back on the ground now. Obviously, we don't carpool. We, we have small groups. We've got sanitising protocols for equipment if people are sharing equipment. And here's a shot of one of our volunteers. Very well social distance, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in terms of what we're doing, really, we're back to climate change driven focus now, um, as particularly around the fire. So we've just been, we're in the very fortunate position of just having 50 straight days in New South Wales with no community transmission of COVID-19. Um, so we're very fortunate. Um, most of our restrictions have now eased up completely. And so we are now focused on getting across all of our study sites to assess surviving wildlife, particularly koalas. We're looking at mapping fire refugia and climate refugia and trying to pull the conversation back towards climate change. Um, and in the longer term to try and prioritise management actions. So find out where we've got surviving koalas and what we need to do to bring them back um, and which areas to prioritise and to work with the communities as well. Um, and that's all for me for now, I think. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, we, we should not forget about the urgency to, to protect wildlife and sometimes urgent grants are, are the only way for organizations to survive. Remco, how did the virus impact it, IUCN and your work as grants coordinator? Thanks, uh, Anna. Uh, let me just uh, try to share my screen as well. Um, there, I think that should be visible. So um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to speak uh, primarily from uh, the uh, African perspective because the biggest um, uh, groundbreaking initiative that we currently have uh, is in Africa, uh, focusing on African wildlife, uh, primarily on carnivores. Um, but um, as, as part of that initiative, we, uh, we, we did already have before the, uh, the, the event of the pandemic, uh, we already had a, uh, a pot of money for, um, uh, for rapid action grants. So these are grants that respond to emergency situations. Uh, and uh, before the pandemic hit, we had maybe you know, six applications uh, for, for that um, throughout a year. Um, and the pandemic changed that quite drastically. Uh, so from the African perspective then, the, the impacts that we've seen on species conservation uh, have been um, varied. There have been several. Um, so there's been a reduced capacity for anti-poaching anti patrols. Uh, this has been a result of uh, a, loss of, uh, a loss of income uh, of the organizations who uh, make sure that these patrols happen. Uh, also, um, uh, a result of uh, travel restrictions and uh, movement restrictions, which has also affected the morale of rangers who have been stuck in the field and unable to uh, to go home. Uh, so, so this has been uh, one of the bigger impacts uh, that we've seen. Um, on the other hand, uh, there has been a larger uh, need for anti-poaching because poaching incidences have increased um, and not necessarily poaching for commercial purposes, but uh, poaching for, for, for subsistence purposes uh, has, uh, has directly increased as a result of the loss of income from tourism. And we see this uh, very clearly in, uh, in, in many African rural communities that depend on wildlife tourism for their income uh, with, the, uh, with the cancellation of international tourism altogether. Uh, they suddenly didn't have any income. And so they, they needed to find uh, alternative uh, means uh, to, to take care of their families. And poaching has been one of the, um, uh, one of the, re one of the, uh, the ways in which they've been able to provide for their families. 
And so when, when people resort to uh, subsistence hunting, uh, especially when, uh, when it is at an unsustainable level, um, you know, one of the means that are uh, adopted regularly in, in, in many parts of Africa uh, is uh, through snaring. And, uh, and these wire snares, they, uh, they, they target any species indiscriminately. So uh, the endangered species, threatened, threatened species uh, are also being caught in these snares. Uh, and, uh, and so there's, there's been an increased risk um, of, of, uh, of poaching for, for many threatened species. Uh, also, the, the lockdowns and the, the limitations that were put on um, uh, gathering in groups has limited the capacity and the ability of, uh, of, of um, conservation organizations to engage with uh, the communities that live around conservation areas or who live with wildlife uh, in general. And so this has, uh, has created also a challenge in terms of their attitude uh, towards, towards wildlife, their acceptance of uh, uh, of, of, of um, you know, human wildlife coexistence and uh, an increase perhaps in human wildlife conflict. Uh, also, uh, the risk of transmission of COVID-19 was already mentioned by one of the previous speakers, uh, particularly in the case of uh, great apes. So gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, um, many of these uh, populations uh, have been habituated uh, to uh, be tourist attractions. Uh, and these, um, despite the, the, the cancellation of tourism, uh, these habituated primates, they, they needed to be monitored on a regular basis. So there's still a, a, a contact between, between humans and, uh, and these uh, primates. And so uh, that required uh, um, you know, a, a revision of the protocols uh, to make sure that these animals uh, remain safe from, inf from infection with COVID-19. So uh, at, uh, at the level of ICN Save Our Species, this has affected uh, our work um, very significantly. Um, we've, uh, we've seen uh, a vast increase in demand uh, for, uh, for rapid action grants. Um, and uh, thanks to our donor, the European Union, we were able to, uh, to uh, set aside uh, four and a half million euros uh, for uh, for projects that respond directly to uh, emergencies that resulted from the from the pandemic, uh, and uh, and so we have received a, a tremendous amount of applications, uh, really 270 applications over the over the space of nine months, um, something that's really unheard of for us, uh, and we were able to uh, to fund uh, 30 of those uh, projects. Um, that directly respond to, to COVID-19 emergencies across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so we had the call for proposals was open um, from, uh, from April last year until mid-December. Uh, and that generated, as I mentioned, a lot of interest. Uh, we still have an open call for proposals uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, so uh, applicants from that country are still welcome to apply. But what we've been able to uh, to do with uh, uh, with these grants is not only did we um, uh, did we reach more than one million beneficiaries uh, in the local communities, uh, but these grants they address uh, these threats directly. So uh, we've been able to, uh, in many cases, maintain and even increase the anti poaching effort by uh, putting more boots on the ground. Uh, this has been. Uh, also an opportunity for some of the local communities who lost income as tourist guides, for example, uh, or, or otherwise, uh, to, uh, to have um, some job security. Um, aside from that, uh, the projects we support have also introduced other, uh, you know, alternative livelihoods that uh, to, to help diver diversify uh, the income streams in these communities, so they become less dependent on uh, tourism and wildlife tourism uh, based uh, uh, activities. Um, so uh, several of, of the projects we funded also have uh, addressed the, the risk to, to great apes. So uh, keeping them safe from infection uh, that also uh, is in, in uh, you know, in close, um, you know, working very closely with the local communities to also make sure that they understand 
uh, what the risks are, not only to the apes, but to themselves. Uh, and so uh, awareness raising has been uh, an important part of, uh, of the projects that we funded as well, uh, including uh, for improving public health, making also available uh, the uh, protective equipment uh, that, uh, that local communities in, in these uh, remote places don't necessarily have access to. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, Remco, and thank you all for your insights and very interesting remarks. We all know that um, we cannot place wildlife conservation on hold, and we recognize the importance of looking ahead and preparing for a more sustainable future. So this is a question for everyone, for all the speakers moving forward after the pandemic. What can we do to protect wildlife and to ensure a better future on a conservation basis? Uh, can we start with uh, Vishen Bonal, please? You are on mute. Can you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all the speakers who had uh, done a wonderful presentation on the subjects. Uh, uh, in the different field uh, where they are, they have been working. Um, so far as your question is concerned, you see, uh, as I just narrated that uh, if we talk of COVID-19, its impact. So I felt that there, there had been more positive than the negative, uh, of course, but negative, if we talk, then yes, uh, it has been in global level, and it has been a local level, and even in the a unit level also it has affected both health and economic uh, specifically but uh, so far as wildlife conservation is concerned i think uh, uh, you know it goes not only for covid period but it goes for forever in fact you know it's it's a challenge for the you know the, the protectors uh, the, the uh, especially the frontline staffs those who had been working in the uh, protected areas even in the odd hours um you see uh the effort has been uh there and it, it will be there for you know um in the source area but my concern is you know if we uh, really want to stop and control so i think we need to strike on the consumption center uh especially where the wildlife uh, whether it is live or uh, part of uh, parts of wildlife is concerned so if we can control over the you know, consumption center where the you know the, the farming is, you know, is still going on, and uh, in the name of farmed animals, uh, the products are being used. I think number of times there had the, this subject has been raised, uh, but uh, perhaps we have not been able to get the uh, you know full uh, result on that. Still, the effort is there from the various organizations. So. Uh, still, I, I still feel that if uh, we can control on the consumption centers to the extent, um, definitely the source area will be, uh, will be you know, under control and it will be easy for the life will be easy for the, you know, the frontline staffs. Second is, uh, you know, as uh, the deforestation or uh, land use pattern change and uh, diversion of land is the major factor. I think we we uh, need to be pragmatic on that. You know, yes, development is required; it has to be there. Uh, but as far as possible, uh, it should be uh, by giving the importance to the forest and wildlife area. As far as possible, we should avoid uh, to uh, have such projects in those areas, whether uh, whether be it uh, the core area or buffer or corridors. Uh, so first effort should be to avoid that, and then if it is not possible, then with the mitigation measures, then uh, should uh, be implemented. So I think uh, you know um, it's not impossible. You know it's always uh, possible. I think uh, a lot of technology has improved. A lot of things are uh, you know coming up in the new innovative ideas. So um, I think these are the two uh, basic things which I, I felt apart from the the involvement of the local people, you know, as, as I mentioned, that ing indigenous people uh, of those protected areas and then the forest areas, 
has to be given uh, the proper importance uh, so that they feel the the own, owning the uh, the area and then um, instead of damaging it uh, maybe for the need like firewood and things like that and so they can think of think in a positive way regulate the, everything you know in their level itself and where uh, we as an organization uh, from the government department or from the NGOs, we can, uh, we should extend the help to those people uh, to at least cater the basic need. Uh, like, you know, firewood is the basic need for them, depending uh, uh, on the forest and all. So if we provide the LPG, the gas and all things like that, perhaps uh, these three uh, things uh, we uh, highlight. But uh, you know, most of the country and uh, especially the India, I think uh, the the population, hum the po increase of population, especially in a human being, is one of the major factor. You see, that's why the the, the forest land is diverted for those people. You know, land use change is because of that. So uh, I think uh, you know, of course, it is not in the hands of uh, the the, the uh, organization like you and us or the, or the department. Uh, overall, you know, one has to control the overpopulation of human being. I, I, that is what I personally feel. So that uh, the uh, the house, the home of the wildlife, elephant, tigers, and all, they are not damaged or uh, diverted for for such purposes. I hope uh, uh, some of the points which I thought must be clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving forward to to Robert now uh, on solutions uh, for the future. What's your take on that, Robert, from United for Wildlife? Yeah, thanks, Anna. I, I think it comes down to a few uh, quite specific points for us. You know, first one being an obvious continue to raise awareness of the issue. I think, you know, jumping on the back of the momentum that we're seeing at the moment on the back of uh, you know, COVID-19, but, but there's an increased public interest in biodiversity. Uh, and we really want to ensure that that isn't lost in the coming years. And they're specifically looking at the origins, and it's been covered by the other speakers, the origins of COVID-19. Um, you know, it's clear that the removal of species from rural environments and in integrating them in more urban settings carries considerable risk. So, you know, that looking even, you know, to the extent of global health, economies and security, and that uh, messaging needs to continue for the for the sort of wider public uh, to ensure that it doesn't get lost. The other point is around, um, you know, a bit like us, but ensuring um, uptake of public private partnerships to combat illegal wildlife trade. So, you know, that age old phrase, it takes a network to defeat a network. You know, these criminal organizations that, that traffic wildlife from one continent to the other, it, it's they're big organizations and networks of businesses along the way. You know, we, um, we, we've got to ensure that the NGOs are tied together with private sector, are tied together and supported by law enforcement and government um, to ensure that, you know, we, we get successful outcomes and eventually deter criminal operations. Um, the other one is around uh, increasing regulatory frameworks and policy. So I think, you know, um, looking at improvements that better match the true value of this crime. Typically, we talk about the illegal wildlife trade is being valued around $20 billion per year. But actually, if you look at some World Bank reports and you include, you know, if you, you really go to town on wildlife and you include logging and fishing, you're looking, you know, they state between one and $2 trillion a year. And I think the regulatory and policy response to wildlife trafficking doesn't match that value. You know, you see that in narcotics, you know, but you just don't see it in wildlife trade. So I, that's something I think, you know, there needs to be some improvement on. And then building on that is the third, the fourth, point is on the tackling corruption you know on the you know uh, so much of the illegal wildlife trade is is facilitated is facilitated by corruption so you know whether it's poaching trafficking or the supply side you know a global stance to address this corruption is pretty important moving forward there's a few recommendations that maybe something like the un convention against transnational organized crime could implement wildlife trafficking as one of their protocols, so it sits up there with human trafficking and say narcotics. Um, and those sort of conversations need to be thought through and, and potentially implemented because, you know, you know, the corruption is such a massive part of it. Absolutely right, Robert, thank you so much. Um, uh, from a zoo perspective, José Vier Freire, um, what's your view on, on the future uh, and what we can do to protect wildlife? 
and mute myself. Okay. So uh, regarding uh, the particular uh, project and regarding regarding the per another similar uh, breeding programs, uh, one thing that that zoos need to do more is to increase uh, the, the holding capacity uh, for surplus animals. So when if this happens again, so if the if the if we have an, another pandemic and we stop doing transports, we need to be able to keep animals at the zoo for more time. This is one of the problems that we are facing, not only with the Persian leopard, but also to Lisbon. Uh, one of the things we need. Another, another be to try to get, and I've been discussing this with some colleagues of mine, uh, to get some, some uh, transport companies, air and transport companies, to be more aware of work that zoos are doing um, on construction uh, in order to get uh, get them more involved in all these uh, uh, operations. Another thing would be move uh, communication between zoos and international na nation and nature conservation uh, organization in order to create a global vision and work as a team on uh, solving problems is another thing that we had uh, during the last year. And we have been improving that. Uh, another point I would like to, 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 to say is uh, regarding all the contributions that zoos do uh, for uh, uh, conservation programs in situ, conservation programs, because uh, now uh, we, uh, are, are facing this uh, complicated uh, era. We, we, we need, most of the zoos don't have uh, funds conservation programs. So this is something that I don't have a solution for this problem, but uh, will be discussed in the future, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Zé. And now uh, the same question for uh, Rui Bernardino as well, from a, a veterinarian perspective, um, what's your take on the solution side of, uh, of conservation after the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Well, we are we are still in the in the in the learning phase of uh, of the, of this pandemic. We we have not we are not close to the end. Um, I think from a technical perspective. Uh, when we have to guarantee a continuous work, a very specific work and specialized work, one of the things that have to take that we have to consider is that in the last years, uh, even in human medicine, specialization was seen as something uh, that could give us um, uh, that, that could be the, 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 the thing to do. Even in human medicine, this was true in the last two decades. Um, but we know that in a, in a state like this, when we have a convulsion, when you have an outbreak, when we have a, a situation that is disruptive, we always have we always have to 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 come back to our basis and which is our cap capability of adaptation and to do different tasks that in our daily work we, we, we are not meant to, to do. I'm sure it happened to everyone, even at our homes. Uh, we, we, we had to uh, gain uh, once more the skills to, to deal with different uh, issues that we were not uh, prepared in the, last, in the last years. So I think this was a, a big lesson for all of us um, uh, and in terms of technical, in terms of technical assistance um, in the last years, I'm sure I'm doing much less specific work uh, high tech specific work and much more uh, broad work, and and I see that from the perspective of the keepers, from the perspective of the maintenance uh, teams, from the perspective of the curators, of the veterinarians, of all of us. So we we always have the the adaptation capability that it's our um, most uh, important uh, thing to to use in a scenario like this so it's it's a learning process it's not close to the end and it's 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 
we, we are still on it, but I think in the future it, 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 it will be much better because now even people that thought that these kind of problems um, that we are not related with remote areas, that we are not related with, uh, with people that live in other parts of the world, we are all together, we are all, are, are all related. Uh, we 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 ha we know that one else is it's a, it's a big thing because the the animals else and uh, humans else are are kept together, but also the world is one world. We don't have two or three or four different worlds. We are all together on this, and I think uh, humanity have here uh, uh, had a challenge, and have now the opportunity to to, to become better in the, in the in the future for sure. Thank you, thank you, Rui. Uh, now for, for Kelly as uh, running an organization in, in Science for Wildlife in, in Australia, uh, what do you think needs to be done uh, post pandemic? Yeah, that's a very good question. So last year for us, we learned a lot of lessons, um, not just from COVID-19, but climate change and bushfires. And I guess one of the key lessons that came out of it was the importance of landscape scale conservation. Um, as was mentioned earlier, you know, going beyond the protected areas into the buffer zones and developed areas. So one thing we did learn was that our national park system and our protected area system, it's not the biodiversity refuge we'd hoped for. You know, that's where the fires burnt. Um, and it was actually the asset protection zones on the edges where people lived all of the resources for fighting these fires had to go into those areas to protect, you know, lives and properties of people. And so we've now got a lot more remnant wildlife that's critically important inside those developed areas that may then help recolonize our protected areas. So, you know, it's, it's always been one key issue, but I think that holistic approach now, it's, it's a bit of a slap in the face to say, actually, we can't just rely on our protected area network. We have to look at how we change our style of management for that. So we in Australia have to look at potentially mapping refugia for fire and other threats and protecting them. Because one of the things we saw with the scale of this event with the fires, normally you have um, you know, smaller fires. So you've got edges and unburnt patches that animals can recolonize from. When you've got fires that burn however many million hectares it was, you know, 80% of the world heritage area plus the rest of the east coast of Australia, you don't have those pockets um, of refugia that things can bounce back from. So it's really important now, I think, to engage communities more. Um, and also there's an extra challenge to that because under COVID-19, you can't just go door knocking and, and hold events. You know, the, the biggest way to get engagement is through participation with people. And that's far more challenging now. So things like this, the online webinars um, and using technology to reach people is really important tool as well. Um, and all of that, you know, it ties into the threats that we had before the pandemic um, in terms of habitat destruction, human encroachment, climate change um, and population growth. So all of the big issues are, are there um, and still going. And, and from this side, we're, we're just really seeing how all of those factors interplay um, and, and how critical it is to move quickly on them. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Now, uh, passing the word on to, to Remco as uh, a Species cons Conservation Grants Coordinator, uh, having this IUCN regulatory perspective and overview, what's your take on solutions moving forward after the pandemic? Thank you, Anna. Yeah, um, well, at, at the risk of repeating some of the things that have already been said, um, just wanted to go back for a brief moment to the, uh, to the enabling factors that really can cause the emergence of zoonotic diseases to become increasingly likely. And we've already heard from other speakers how habitat fragmentation and land use change leads to increased interaction between humans, domestic animals, and wild species. Um, also how illegal wildlife trade poses a risk. Um, but uh, in addition to that, there's also an increased consumption of wild animals for food. And this is exacerbated uh, also uh, through the increased access to wildlife areas as a result of habitat fragmentation and the expansion of, uh, of, of human settlements into previously remote um, areas. And, and this consumption of wild animals for food may be for subsistence. Uh, some of these, many of these um, uh, human communities that live in these remote places are very uh, poor and they don't have much of an option. 
and in many cases their uh, consumption of wild animals may also be legal. Um, so, uh, but as I mentioned, um, the, the methods applied may lead to uh, a wide variety of species being trapped and hunted indiscriminately uh, and sometimes at unsustainable levels. And so when we're speaking of landscape scale approaches to wildlife conservation, they really need to incorporate activities that actively reduce the potential for zoonosis to enter the human sphere. Uh, and so we're talking about maintaining habitat integrity uh, and connectivity, as uh, we've just heard, um, but also monitoring and managing interactions between wild and domestic species to reduce that transmission risk. Um, and one of the ways in which this can be done, for example, is uh, through uh, animal husbandry, um, reduce the number of livestock in a herd uh, by increasing the, the, the quality of the livestock, uh, and also having a grazing regime uh, that takes into account you know, the seasonal uh, movements of wildlife, uh, the, the, the overlapping uses of um, uh, that domestic herd and the wild herd, um, uh, where they get in touch with each other, for example, in watering holes. Um, so th that needs to be planned more, uh, more strategically. Uh, and also um, efforts need to be made to reduce human incursions into wild habitats. We've, we've heard uh, also already, uh, you know, sometimes it's just a, a need of firewood that drives people to, to go into these uh, uh, wild areas. Uh, so providing alternatives, uh, or be it in the form of LPG uh, or in the form of more efficient cooking stoves, uh, that will help these people to, uh, to, to reduce their need to go into the, into the forest to collect um, uh, forest resources will also you know, reduce the risk of, um, uh, of, of interaction with um, uh, potentially uh, you know, the, the diseases um, that, uh, uh, that are in these, um, uh, in these habitats. So where, where it comes to subsistence hunting, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes this is a necessary component of local livelihoods and it isn't always illegal. Um, so in those cases, what, uh, what can be done uh, is um, not only um, introduce alternative protein sources to so help, help people give them the training and the tools they need to uh, raise poultry, for example, or rabbits or uh, some other uh, type of, uh, of, of uh, domestic protein source. Uh, but also give them the tools and the know-how uh, to make sure that they have access to safe meat handling, uh, safe storage of meat as well, and, and hygiene procedures. Um, and also uh, give them an awareness of, um, uh, of what the risks of zoonoses are. Train them to recognize the symptoms uh, of some of the known uh, diseases that are likely to, to emerge. Um, and then finally, when it comes to, uh, to illegal wildlife trade, um, I think Robert has, has already mentioned uh, a lot of what can be done at the, at the market end of the supply chain. Uh, but I think there, there definitely also needs to be uh, an increased investment in law enforcement uh, in the field. Uh, so more, more patrolling uh, and education programs as well. Uh, to reduce uh, the, um, uh, the actual poaching on the ground. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Remco. I also take this opportunity as, as well as we have here, the president of the Mirpuri Foundation. He's here with us. So I'll ask his opinion on, on this as well, as it was mentioned throughout the webinar, the role of foundations and the private sector raising awareness on on biodiversity, what should be the role of foundations on this very important uh, raising awareness side? Anna, thank you. Uh, I think that um, the way the Mirpuri Foundation has been uh, working uh, on the wildlife conservation is probably uh, the, uh, the right approach. Uh, by partnering with uh, institutions that are working on the field, with scientists that uh, are uh, on the ground, dealing with the challenging with the challenges uh, on the daily basis, and support them to do the work uh, the best to the best of their uh, uh, capabilities. 
Um, we have, uh, over the last uh, almost two hours, we have uh, heard about uh, some uh, positives and negatives of the impact of the COVID-19 on the wildlife conservation. Uh, certainly, uh, in certain parts of the world, it seems that the positives were uh, uh, better than the negatives, and in other parts of the whole, the, the opposite. Um, and um, uh, in the case of the Mirpuri Foundation, uh, it uh, becomes evident that there is a clear crossover between wildlife conservation and 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 other uh, aspects of our work, like the climate change. Uh, that needs that we we need to dig further uh, with our uh, partner institutions uh, that are working uh, on on the fields. So Hannah, back to you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. And we are reaching the end of our webinar, an insightful one. Thanks to all of our speakers. We still have a few minutes for Q and A, so let's go over a few questions that we received this week uh, here as well on and through our live stream. Um, I'm checking a few of them. I'll start with Robert. Uh, Rob, uh, what should governments do to stop the poaching increase after the lockdown? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think Remco touched on this a bit. See, it's it's probably if you're looking specifically at poaching, um, it's. Uh, um, I guess reinforcing the security arrangements they already have, you know, is that the law enforcement, you know, is that, um, uh, you know, rangers and things like that. But there's also probably quite a bit to do, you know, conservation organisations themselves, uh, because of COVID, have got a significant lack of funding now. And I think, you know, there's something the public can do is to, to sort of pump some more money into some of those conservation efforts that fund their own ranger programmes, you know, that would have, a, that would have an impact. Um, you know, and I think the other part is, you know, if you're again looking at poaching, the once the animals are being killed, you know, they've got to be moved to market, and um, and so it's it's tighter understanding around the border points or checkpoints. You know, what are you looking for? You know, um, what are the concealment methods? What are the common routes taken? It's sort of intelligence-led, uh, I guess, investigations to sort of crack down all you're all you're trying to do at the end of this. Is to make it very difficult to criminals for criminals to, to to carry out the trade. You know, looking to disrupt. You're not. You don't necessarily have to cancel out completely. But if all the criminals are doing is it's an easy way to make money. So if you can make it slightly more difficult, they'll flip to something else, or they'll you know they might get legitimate businesses. You know, to them it's just an easy way to make money. So yeah, so it's looking at those things that could disrupt or um, or heavily hinder a criminals. You know, ease of access to wildlife, but also um, you know the the, the sell and uh, sort of trafficking of it. Thank you, thank you, Rob. There's an interesting question here that uh, uh, Hui already um, answered in the Q and A, but I'll ask it again. Uh, why are some animals more susceptible to get infected? Um, and uh, and I'll add to it, asking for uh, vaccines. Are vaccines important in the post-pandemic phase? Hui. Well, regarding the, the susceptibility, it depends on the uh, on the capability of the virus for binding to specific places of the ACE2 receptor. So the, the good thing is that in this one year period, uh, it, it is almost clear which parts are essential for that binding and for the vi virus to get in, into the cells. Um, we know we know from the databases which animals have that particular binding capabilities of the of the receptor to get the virus in so we know for example why bats cannot be the should not be the direct uh, transmitter of the virus for people because they have well the, that there are many different species of, of bats but the ones that were studied the the binding capabilities of the receptors are not the same as we have we, we humans so we can predict more or less which species are more prone for the virus, we, which we cannot do because we cannot test uh, our immuno immunological systems uh, or the viral loads. We cannot predict how this uh, disease will uh, express in each species. It, this, this is something that we have to wait. We, don't, we, we know that, for example, in, in, in zoos in two to three years, all the animals will 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 have to deal with the COVID-19. 
it's 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 impossible to to run away from it because of public because of people that work in um, and mostly after vaccination of people so the virus will be spread among us so the animals will will have that also um, the good point and the good thing is that vaccines for uh, for animals are being developed also so what we have to look in the future is that which animals can can uh, have a, 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 will be a target for that vaccines so but it's it's uh, we have to wait to have more more answers but there are a lot of things that are being done right now Okay, I'll, I have as well a more general question, I think that uh, for, for a lot of the speakers, uh, what definitive measures will this pandemic help to implement? Um, Jose, can you, can you provide an answer from, from your perspective? You are on mute, you are on mute. <laughs> So <laughs> that was good. So uh, what it will provide, it, it's a better communication. We need to be ready to communicate, to help each other, uh, to work uh, with the same goal. I think, uh, and like we said before, this is still uh, the beginning. We, we, we will have more solutions in the end and more. That's what I think. So what, uh, and I'll ask that um, for, for everyone, and I'll ask with, with Remco, Remco uh, what kind of measures uh, did you start to implement because of the pandemic and that you're sticking with from this point forward at IUCN? Well, thanks, Anna. Well, some of the things that I've mentioned before about what needs to be done moving forward are already things that we are, uh, that we are implementing through our grant making program. Uh, you know, uh, maintaining connectivity between uh, habitat patches uh, is something that is a, a core part of uh, many of the projects that we, uh, that we fund. Um, also providing alternatives uh, to, uh, to reduce the, the dependence uh, on the unsustainable use of uh, natural resources is something that is uh, that, that runs like a red line through all of the projects that we that we fund. So this is something that we will continue to do uh, and uh, step up as well uh, and uh, make sure that we will find ways to, uh, uh, to, to help uh, our grantees learn from each other, uh, see what works in, uh, in certain situations and, uh, and help them apply that uh, in their own situations as well and uh, just facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange of experience within that regard. Uh, and uh, t taking taking really a, a more strategic approach to um, mainstreaming these types of uh, zoonotic pre zoonosis preparedness uh, into uh, into the design of the projects that we fund. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have more time. We've now reached the end of the Mirfuri Foundation webinar, the impact of COVID-19 on wildlife conservation. So I would like to thank our speakers again for their valuable presentations and feedback on this subject, uh, as well to the, to the president of the Mirfuri Foundation for promoting the webinar and for everyone joining the webinar all over the world. I think that together we can create a united front for preservation, for building a uh, more sustainable future post pandemic. And uh, we need for sure to build back better to create resiliency and solutions uh, for this unprecedented crisis. This is also a wildlife conservation challenge and one that we will tackle for sure in the upcoming time. So thank you everyone and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hel. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks all. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.